Right, uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome back. Um, not sure how many of you uh, were in attendance at yesterday's uh, presentation on flight dispatch. This will be something uh, similar. Uh, it won't be really the question answer format as we did uh, yesterday. Uh, more kind of a uh, like a lecture presentation, just kind of walking through the steps and some of the things that we look at uh, as we're preparing the uh, the flight plan. So uh, we would ask if you do have any questions, just kind of hold those until the end. Uh, we'll try to take them uh, if we have time, uh, or we're, we're here all weekend. Uh, you can catch us afterwards, and uh, we'd be happy to answer any questions you have at that point. So uh, I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to Matt, and we'll, uh, we'll get going. So we've got a lot of material and a short time to get there. So. All right, yeah, welcome to the presentation. Let's see here. Oh, there we go. Um, yeah, you don't care about me at all, so. Uh, all right, so uh, a little bit about myself. My name is Matt Bartles. I'm, uh, Dispatcher since 2008. I uh, started off at a regional airline called Compass Airlines. Uh, went up the ranks there, did pretty much every job I could in system operations, uh, dispatch, supervisor, duty director, line check. Uh, we flew the 170 and the 175 there. Uh, followed the normal career progression. I went to a major airline after that, got hired on by Delta Airlines. Uh, domestic flight dispatcher there, also had international qualifications for the whole world. I uh, did some on-the-job training there, and you can see Delta's fleet. They fly pretty much every single airplane that flies. And then uh, needed to change the scenery and uh, get closer to home. So in 2020, I went to United at the worst possible time. Uh, got furloughed, but uh, we're, we're back up and running. So uh, very happy to be dispatching again. <clears throat> and uh, as mentioned, uh, my name is Mike Collier. Uh, similar progression to uh, Matt. I've been uh, I've been doing this for about 25 years now. So I've got my, got my certificate back in '96. Uh, I started my first job at uh, Mesa Airlines, uh, working with uh, Beach 1900s and Dash 8s, and uh, then the brand new CRJ 200 series. So kind of the uh, jets were new to the industry back then. So uh, from there, I went to uh, America West Airlines in '98. Spent uh, right about 10 years in the, in the desert. Uh, with America West out there and kind of transitioned through the merger with U.S. Air, U.S. Airways. Uh, they moved us to Pittsburgh, uh, international dispatcher uh, with them uh, until the merger with American Airlines. I uh, transitioned into the, to the training department at the U.S. Airways um, prior to the merger. Still in the training department with uh, American Airlines, full-time training instructor now. I uh, do still work the desk uh, a few times a month, uh, not every day. Uh, also, uh, ATS, basically, it's, a, it's an air transportation supervisor. Uh, it's kind of the dispatch version of a check airman. So it's uh, kind of my day-to-day -day duties now. So it's, uh, again, 25 years in the industry uh, at this point, and uh, love every minute of it. So, uh, so we'll go ahead and uh, jump into kind of the process on uh, what it is we look at every day when planning the flights. So the first question I have for you, how many people do you think does it take to get an aircrew from here right at the gate? to here landing on the uh, runway at the destination and taxiing in. You think it's one, two, three, 12? 22, okay. It takes an entire team to accomplish that. So we start off, you know, you have your aircraft uh, or airport customer service agents, you know, they check you in, you board the flight. Ramp service agents doing all the servicing of the aircraft, loading the bags, pushing the airplane back. These are the kind of the common ones you would think of. Air traffic controllers, obviously, keeping the airplane separated and safe. Aircraft maintenance technicians, making sure that every airplane is safe and airworthy. Flight attendants to uh, protect your safety and help you in the case of an emergency. Operations managers who direct the uh, flow of the entire airline. You got meteorologists that will uh, evaluate the weather for us. Operational support staff, such as crew scheduling, uh, aircraft routers, pretty much anybody you could think that would support the operation. You've got the corporate staff, you know, we need the uh, finance people to tell us we're spending too much money. And then obviously the pilots and most importantly the dispatchers. <laughs> so as a simmer, you're performing all these tasks whether you realize it or not. So if you have GSX, you're doing customer service and gate and uh, ramp, right? Because you're boarding passengers, you're loading baggage. Uh, if you're getting up to get yourself a drink or snack, well, that's one of the flight attendant duties, even though it's not their primary one. If you're vectoring yourself for an approach, you're air traffic control. 
if you're trying to think what the weather's going to do, you're going to do just as good as the real world meteorologist. <laughs> and if you're troubleshooting the uh, issues or if you're using, you know, PMDGs, you know, you know, change the wheel feature or something, that's maintenance. If you're planning the flight, choosing alternates, determine the fuel load, well, that's, that's my job, that's dispatch. And then obviously you're the pilot when you're flying, right? So we're unique in flight simulation because we can participate at any level we want. We can fly an F-18 at 500 feet just for fun. But most of us here at Expo, we're not that simmer, right? We look for that realistic experience. That's why we come to these conventions. We want to push the limits of the hobby. So that's why we're here. We're going to dig deeper into a specialty known as operations management as well as flight dispatch. That way you can go home and be able to dispatch your next flight simulator flight like the professionals do. Okay, so flight dispatch, operations management. We have two primary specialties in the Airline Operations Center. And they're similar jobs, but they have very different responsibilities. So the dispatcher is going to be responsible for the overall safety of flight and the operational control. They're going to focus on one single flight at a time. <clears throat> they are going to look at the routing we take and the fuel load, how much fuel we load on the aircraft. If something breaks on the aircraft, maintenance calls us. We have to approve the uh, deferral to say it's okay. Uh, we will delay or cancel flights in the name of safety, uh, which is you'll see in a, the next slide is very different from uh, economically. So if the weather's bad, we can say we're not going to fly there. It's not a good idea. We're going to communicate with the individual flights en route. We have a way of sending text messages up to all the uh, airplanes, keep the communication going. We also can talk to them on two-way radios. We have all kinds of communications tools. And then the biggest one, we share legal responsibility of the flight with the captain. It's a 50-50 street. Uh, the joke is, if something happens to an airplane, the captain dies and I go to jail. <laughs> Operations manager, on the other hand, they ensure schedule integrity. So they're usually responsible for, either, for a whole fleet of airplanes at the airline. And they need to make sure that the airplane, the crew, the maintenance functions, everything lines up. So we have an airplane, we have a crew, we can actually operate the flight. They're focused on the big picture stuff because they trust them to see it. They don't want to show it to me. Uh, they're going to develop recovery plans for regular operations. So if we have a massive weather event coming in, they're going to start talking about uh, what do we want to do, how do we want to scale down the airline so we can bring the airline back up after the event. They all delay flights for operational reasons. Maybe there's an aircraft coming in late or they need to do a last minute swap. That's when they're going to make that delay um, as opposed to safety of flight, which is on the dispatcher. And then they coordinate the equipment swap. So if your airplane breaks and we have another airplane, they're the one that's going to coordinate how we get that airplane routed onto your line of flying. So we both make operational decisions, but it's really the scope of the issue that uh, defines who's responsible. So in this example, you have a line of thunderstorms heading for your destination. ATC tells the flight, we're going to have to hold until the weather clears. You're going to take a 45 minute hold. And we talk with the captain and we say, you know what? We're going to go to the alternate. It's, uh, we're not going to get in. Who do you think is responsible for making that decision? Is it the dispatcher or the uh, operations manager? Dispatch, absolutely, that's the dispatcher's job. On the other side, if we have a hurricane that's gonna hit South Florida in three days, meteorology says up till eight hours prior to landfall, we can still operate aircraft, it'll be safe. And if we do that, we're gonna evacuate people, it's gonna look good, we're gonna get good press, but we have to decide when we're gonna stop that operation. So that would be the operations manager that's tasked with that. So individual decisions, dispatch, airline operation, operations manager. And the reason we do that is the FAA says there's only two people that are allowed to make operational decisions on an individual flight. That's the pilot in command and the aircraft dispatcher. This is coded in the regulations, the part 121. It's known as operational control. And that's the authority over initiating, conducting, or terminating a flight and the only people allowed to exercise operational control are the pilot and the dispatcher, and it's the foundation of our system. So in layman's terms, you can see the regulation up there if you want. No flight can depart unless the captain and the dispatcher agree it can be completed safely. No flight can, can, uh, sorry, can continue to its destination if at any point the captain or the dispatcher think it's unsafe. So captain may want to continue because he wants to get to the hotel bar. And I say, that's not a good idea because of weather or whatever. He cannot continue. He has to divert. So 
FAA has given the aircraft dispatcher a lot of responsibility. We have a lot of duties. We have six that are prescribed. We're going to uh, focus on the primary two for this uh, uh, presentation for time. And it's our, the bulk of our job, the pre-flight planning and the flight following and flight monitoring. So we're going to start with pre-flight planning. So what do we consider as dispatchers when we uh, flight plan? Safety, paramount, number one. Everything else is meaningless if the flight's not safe. Roped into that, we're going to look at weather, destination, departure, alternate airports, any en route hazards, turbulence, severe turbulence, volcanic ash. There could be political actions on international flights. We don't want to fly through a certain airspace potentially. Aircraft performance issues. Am I at a weight where I can lift the aircraft off the ground? If uh, things are broken or missing on the aircraft, the airport conditions, air traffic delays, are we going into Kennedy and we're holding? And then thing I care about the least is the economy of the flight. Yeah, we're a business, we want to make money, but that's the last thing in my mind. Everything else is more important. So goal, origin to destination, using the least amount of fuel and time possible to ensure safety. As I said, that means we might go you know, over the econ route, but that's in the name of safety and, and passenger comfort. So we're going to plan a flight to, from LA to JFK today. We need a flight planning system, though. All right, well, this isn't really a flight planning system, but some tools you can use to bring some realism are things like Navigraph, FlightAware, SkyVector. You'll get some real-world routes out of that. You'll see the charts that you need, all good things. A better option is SimBrief. SimBrief creates a dispatch release using the popular uh, airline formats, so you can have a Delta release, a United release, an American release. It'll look close to the real thing. They have advanced route finding capabilities in there. They have realistic fuel burns and uh, profiles, and they can do ETOP scenarios as well. But the Cadillac still PFPX, Professional Flight Planner X. It's produced by Flight SimSoft, and it's a powerful flight planner. It can do pretty much anything a real-world flight planner can do. Um, multiple dispatch functions, multiple ETPs, ETOP scenarios, uh, planned redispatch, which is more of an international thing we won't be covering today. And then it has uh, TopCat, which is a sister program. That's a little bit older, but it still works for performance data for the PMDG products, pretty much all the main um, payware products. As I said, it's very, very close to our real world um, systems. All right, so we're going to use PFPX to plan the flight today. So we have about six steps we follow. Um, give or take when we plan a flight. First thing we're gonna do is check the aircraft and the MEL status. We're gonna review the departure and arrival weather. We're gonna select an alternate if it's required. We're gonna review the en route weather and we're gonna plan the route. We're gonna determine the fuel load. And then finally, we're gonna release the uh, flight and file the flight plan. So I'm gonna have uh, Mike talk you through the first few steps. All right, thank you, Matt. So. Uh you know, Matt mentioned we just, uh, that's kind of the general overview of uh, some of the things that we look at when we're going through the flight planning process. All right, so uh, kind of step one here, we'll uh, just check out our airplane for the day. So it's going to be a 777 Transcon flight. Um, it has an MEL 352103. So uh, what is an MEL? Yeah, minimum equipment list for those of you that are in the know there. So uh, MEL, so that means something on the aircraft is broken, All right? So something doesn't work, okay? Uh, there's also something called a CDL, a configuration deviation list. So that means something on the aircraft is missing. So that could be uh, little, you know, like little access doors, uh, you know, panels and things of that nature. So if things like that are missing, uh, oftentimes that comes with a performance penalty, you know, the inc increased drag with the missing panels and things. So it you know, increases the fuel burn potentially. So we have to consider things of that nature. Uh, MELs, that, uh, some of the penalties and restrictions on those can really run, run the gamut, you know, from altitude restrictions to airspeed restrictions, uh, approach and landing uh, minimum restrictions, uh, takeoff and landing performance uh, limitations. So it's, uh, there's a, really a lot to look at uh, and consider. Uh, on some of these items, all right? So with our particular, the clicker going here, uh, MEL, we'll take a look at that. So, uh, th so these items are some things that uh, may be either broken or missing and we can still legally dispatch the airplane, all right? So as long as we're uh, considering the uh, penalties there. 
So a little, little pro tip from us to you, uh, try adding some MEL CDL items to increase the realism and add some challenges to your flight. Uh, you can find these online. So the, the master MELs are available online. Uh, the, the URL for this thing is about this long, so I'm not going to try to read it to you or put it on the screen to copy down. So the fastest way to get to that, if you, if you just Google Master MEL, it'll come up in the list. Uh, so it's available through the FAA website, through that, uh, that FSIMS flight scan. Three zero zero. So when we're doing our planning, we have to make sure we consider that. Okay. So on to step two. After we've uh, kind of reviewed our airplane and the condition for the day, uh, we want to review our departure and arrival weather. So there's some uh, regulatory uh, items uh, that we need to consider for that, right? So uh, one twenty one five ninety nine. We have to uh, be familiar with the weather conditions uh, along the route to be flown, uh, and 613 release under IFR says we cannot dispatch or release an aircraft unless the appropriate weather uh, indicates that it will be at or above the authorized minimums at the estimated time of arrival. All right, so I'm sure as most of you are aware, the minimums can be found on approach charts. Okay, so there's some kind of dis different formats there. I know uh, Navigraph as uh, this option there now. So if you look at, if you see that little symbol here up at the top, that is an airline air carrier chart symbol. So it just means that the chart has been kind of formatted just for a, you know, a air carrier use. Uh, so the advantage there is, uh, as if, you, if you're if you an airline guy uh, on the sim, it only contains the approach category C and D minimums on there. So it doesn't have A, B, C, and D. So it strips that out, only includes C and D. Uh, and oftentimes it's going to consolidate the uh, minimum. So if there's cat one, cat two, cat three available, it's all, all going to be consolidated on the, uh, on the single chart in the, in the minima section there. Okay, uh, so here's a little table that we put together, some of the uh, approach categories for the uh, common uh, air transport uh, aircraft that we uh, usually fly. Right, so between approach category C, approach category D. So uh, amazingly enough, uh, the 777-200 uh, is approach category C, at least for American. How about United? Yep. Same. So yeah, you think of this big wide body airplane, right? And it's, uh, it's actually approach category C, whereas the 737 is actually approach category D. So it's all based on the approach speed, right? So it's uh, a little, little bit of a maybe a reverse from what you would think. But the, uh, what you're looking at over here is your approach categories, and occasionally you may have different minimums for those approach categories, right? So just uh, be aware of that. All right, so kind of reviewing our weather, so if we're going into uh, JFK, uh, our planned arrival time is just after the 20Z hour. There's our forecast at 19Z. Can we dispatch our flight to JFK? Yep, looks like everybody's saying yes, right? So, uh, well, what's the visibility? Yeah, P6SN greater than six, right? And we only need, if we're looking at the uh, chart here, uh, 200 and a half, and so we only need a half mile visibility. We have better than that, so yeah, we can go. Cat one men's or a half mile for that one. Okay, uh, something else, uh, the uh, weather men's, if the PIC of an airplane is not served 100 hours as a pilot in command, uh, you have to increase your minimums. And so we add, they're adding uh, 100 and a half to those uh, minimums. So the next time you buy a new add-on for your simulator, you're high mins. You've got to add 100 and a half. <laughs> you, can't, you can't shoot as a pro. You've got to make that adjustment, right? You know, you're a high minimum captain on that new add-on. So you've got you to make that adjustment you know, to add that 100 and a half. So now that... Uh, 200 and a half now becomes 301. Okay, uh, 
Step three, alternates. Uh, the uh, regulation for that is 619, alternate airport for destination. So we uh, cannot dispatch an airplane uh, unless for an hour before to one hour after the estimated time of arrival, the uh, re weather reports indicate that the uh, ceiling will be at least 2,000 feet above the airport elevation, and the visibility will be at least three miles. Okay, hour before, hour after, 2,000 feet, three miles. So we kind of remember that as the one, two, three rule. All right, so plus or minus an hour, 2,000, three miles. Okay, so if we're trying to find an alternate now, um, do we need one? Okay, so remember we're arriving in uh, JFK just after the top of the 20Z hour. So that means, remember the hour before, hour after, we have to look at the forecast from 1915 to 2015. That's when we have to consider the uh, forecast weather period. So uh, do we need an alternate? Yes, actually we do, right? So we've got to take a look at this a little closer. You can see we have that uh, broken layer in there at 1,500 feet. So visibility is good, but we have that kind of that, that broken layer at 1,500 feet. Okay, so remember our one, two, three rule, plus or minus 2,003 miles. And point of reference there, a ceiling is either broken or overcast. All right, so uh, scattered does not constitute a ceiling, but broken and overcast constitutes a ceiling. So that broken at 1,500, we would, uh, we would need that alternate. Okay, uh, so which one? That kind of becomes the challenge, right? So we're kind of looking at uh, which, which alternate airport would we need to select? So ideally, we are trying to find the closest airport to the destination uh, that is authorized for company operations and meets the weather minimum requirements. Okay, so sometimes that's not easy to do. Uh, no. Sometimes you got to go out, you know, some, sometimes some days you can find an alternate within, you know, 20, 30, 50 miles, something close in. Some days you might have to go out two or 300 miles, depending on the, uh, on the weather conditions, to find a legal alternate. Okay, so how do we determine the minimums? Is that something we just pull off a chart? Yeah, yes and no. It's, uh, you know, we are looking at the published minimums for the alternate airports, but that's something we have to calculate. All right, so this is how we do that. Okay, so we break it down into what we call like a one nav rule, a two nav rule, and then some other uh, rules we can apply here in a second. But this all comes out of, uh, you guys ever heard of operation specifications or op specs? So this is kind of above and beyond like the, uh, the regulations, the part 121 regulations. So op specs really kind of break down what the airline or the company itself is authorized to do. All right, so, so uh, our op specs uh, for American Airlines may uh, approve us to do some things that maybe United does it and vice versa. All right, so that, uh, that will give us some different authorizations here. But this is all comes out of operation specification C55. Okay. So this is how we do it. Uh, one NAV rule. If we have at least one operational NAV facility that provides an instrument approach, like an ILS or a VOR, uh, we calculate our alternate minimums by adding 400 feet to the uh, published ceiling and one mile to the published visibility. So for example, if we have an ILS that's published at 200 and a half, uh, we add 401 to that to come up with our alternate minimums of 600, one and a half. Okay, so that's the one nav rule. Two nav rule, if we have at least two operational nav facilities providing an instrument approach to different suitable runways. Okay, so we mean different suitable, it can be the same piece of concrete using the reciprocal end, that's okay. Okay, but it has to be, you know, separate facilities there. Uh, we derive our minimums that way by adding 200 feet to the higher ceiling of the two pro approaches we're comparing and a half mile to the visibility of the two approaches that we're comparing. Okay, so in, in, in some instances that we might be adding 200 and a half to the ceiling and visibility of the same approach or it may crisscross. Okay, so we might be adding 200 to the ceiling on one and a half a mile to the visibility on the other, whichever is higher. So the end result of that, you kind of see the example here, right? We have an ILS that's 300 and a half and one that's 200 and three quarter. So this kind of crisscrosses, right? So we're adding the uh, 200 and a half to the higher of each one to come up with 501 and a quarter. 
Okay, so that's how we derive our alternate amendments. So really, what does that mean? So we are, uh, th that, that has to be in the forecast. So when we come up with those minimums, that's what we're looking at in the forecast. So if it, if it says, you know, 500 to one and a quarter, we're looking at the TAF to make sure that uh, the forecast is at or above those forecast minimums uh, to, just for legality purposes. So in continuing with this, uh, deriving the minimums, uh, if we have a usable category two approach, uh, no additives are required at that point. It just becomes a straight uh, 300 and three quarters. So we're not doing math anymore. Right? Uh, same with the usable category three approach. No additives required. The minimums just become uh, 200 and one half. Um, I got to tell you, if I'm looking at an alternate where the best minimums I have are 200 and a half, I'm having a bad day. You know, I don't think, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking a little farther. You know, if I maybe go out a little farther, try to find, uh, find weather, it's a little better. But uh, just from a legality standpoint, uh, we could, in theory, have a forecast down as low as 200 and a half and still be legal if we had a Cat 3 approach. Okay. All right, here's a little table, kind of a little summary table on how we do that, right? So our approach configuration, one nav, two nav, Cat 2, Cat 3. Uh, one nav, two nav does require the additives, so 401, 200 and a half, and then the uh, cat two, cat three mins. Okay, so uh, along with some of the considerations, you know, so we, uh, as far as determining is an alternate suitable or not, we're looking, of course, at the weather at the ETA. Uh, do we have any adverse weather in route or in the terminal area? Of course, you know, we don't want to maybe consider an alternate. You know, if we see this big line of thunderstorms coming through there, say, like, okay, that might not make a very good alternate airport. Uh, ATC constraints, you know, are there uh, ground stops, ground delays, uh, you know, VIP movements, you know, is there maybe like, is the president, you know, going, going to be arriving at that airport, you know, of course, they may be shutting some airspace down. Uh, NOTAMs. It's a big thing there, right? So we're having to look at NOTAMs a lot. You know, are there any runways are going to be closed? Are any navigation facilities out? So that's uh, kind of important for suitability, right? Because we talked about CAT 2, CAT 3 alternate minimums. You know, we have to make sure that the, there are no NOTAMs that say CAT 2, CAT 3 not available, or you know, maybe ILS components are out of service. So uh, you know, things like that you know, affect you know, what we can legally plan. Okay, uh, MEL considerations. So we kind of talked about MELs a few minutes ago, right? So uh, the auto flight systems, you know, maybe uh, braking systems, what are the runway conditions gonna be? You know, how's that gonna affect our uh, landing and stopping capability if you know, we have some components that are out of service? So things like that we have to consider. Uh, customs, you know, if it's an international flight, you know, if we have to divert and land someplace other than where we really wanted to go, uh, you know, if it's an international flight, do we have customs available? And what are the hours? So that's, uh, that, that could be a factor. All right, so going into New York, we're looking at Newark as a potential alternate. Knowing how we derive alternate minimums now, is Newark a legal alternate? So uh, on a potential diversion over to Newark, we would arrive at approximately 2107, just after the top of the 21Z hour. Uh, would Newark be a legal alternate? I see our forecast here at 17Z, winds variable at four, mile and a half with uh, some mist. Uh, a couple of notams in there, right? So we have uh, four left, two, two right, and then on the right and left side there, cat two, cat three, NA. What do you think? Legal, not legal? Yeah, it, it is, we can, be, we can make it work. All right, so we take a look at this here. So it's, I know you guys probably don't have approach plates in front of you right now, but this is uh, kind of what we're looking at for this, right? So this says CAT 2, CAT 3, and not, uh, not authorized. So if you look at the uh, minima section here, we do have CAT, CAT 2, CAT 3 available on four right, but it says we can't use that, so now we can't consider it. All right, so the next option, you know, we're looking at uh, published minima for the uh, left and the right side at 200 and a half. So remember how we apply our, our, our two nav rule? So that would uh, mean adding 200 and a half. So the rules there, it's to the higher of the two, but they're both the same, right? So this is really kind of the best case two nav scenario, right? So uh, you, you know, you're, if you're looking at two approaches with uh, 200 and a half, uh, that gets you to alternate minimums of uh, 401. What would our alternate minimums be if we didn't have these notums? Right, 
Yeah, right. So if we didn't have those notums, we could, in theory, apply the uh, Cat three mins, right? So it, uh, if you know, we're having to watch these notums, right? So uh, without those notums, our alternate minimums would be two hundred and a half. Okay, so it's uh, things like that we have to uh, kind of have to watch. Okay. Uh, also, alternates aren't just for destinations. Okay, we have to also consider the need for a takeoff alternate. Who's ever heard of a takeoff alternate? What's that all about, right? So if the conditions at the airport of takeoff are below landing minimums for that airport, we have to specify basically somewhere else to go. Right? So the idea behind that is if, uh, if they lose an engine on takeoff. Okay? So if you lose an engine on takeoff and, you, and, and the weather where you just departed is below what you can come back around and land, you've got to have somewhere else to go. Right? So we have to consider that then as well. Uh, so if your airplane has two engines, you can go not more than one hour from the departure airport at normal cruise speed. If you have three or more engines, not more than two hours at normal cruise speed. Okay? Uh-oh. L.A., quarter mile fog. All right? And, well, of course, there's notums. There's always notums. All right? So we got to, something, something's always broken. You always got to check that. Right, so the uh, Cat 2, Cat 3 is not authorized, so, but we're at a quarter mile fog. Do we need a takeoff alternate? Yeah, we do. So w without being able to use the Cat 2, Cat 3, right, so we're going to come back to 2.5 right, we're only published at 200 and a half. Okay, so if we, uh, if we depart, lose an engine, we can't come back and land, right? So we're at a quarter mile, we need this. We don't have it. Okay. Something else to uh, consider here, right? The forecast, if we're leaving at 1545, you know, that forecast doesn't go to quarter mile until 17Z. It looks like it happened a little earlier, right? Forecast doesn't say we need one, but actual conditions dictate that we do. Okay, so we have to, uh, we would have to consider that. Come on. It's just like I'm at work again. My clicker doesn't work here. Oop, there it goes. All right, so um, a little table here. Here's some uh, one-hour distances for the uh, some of the kind of commonly used airplanes that we use in the sim. All right, so the, your uh, Airbus uh, 73s. So you can actually go out to 375 miles or 400 miles uh, for some of these uh, narrow-body airplanes. The uh, wide bodies, like your triples, seven eights, uh, you know, same actually as the narrow-body Airbus. 375 miles. Uh, PFPX actually makes this uh, pretty easy if you ever use this, right? So you, there's a little find button up here, takeoff alternate, find. You can actually plug in from Los Angeles. You can go, you can uh, specify your maximum distance. It'll go out and do a search and come back with this whole list of airports within that uh, specified distance. So when you do your uh, takeoff alternate planning, it kind of kind of helps with that, right? So uh, for our purposes today, we will we'll, uh, just assume that uh, Ontario uh, is a legal alternate. We're gonna, not going to make you go derive alternate minimums for uh, Ontario. But having said that, if you're looking at uh, alternate minimums, uh, alternate minimums are the same for takeoff alternates as they are for destination alternates. Okay, same for uh, ETOPS alternates en route. Same rules apply there, with a slight variation. But uh, we'll we'll talk about that offline here. So. Uh, so we're kind of up to step four. Uh, we're going to review the en route weather and uh, I'm going to plan the route. And I'm going to let Matt do that because he works the desk every day and he's way smarter at that than I am. I'm just a training guy. So. Well, you see evidence here of a flight Mike Collier dispatched. Well, you know, you see, yeah, you, that, 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 that's <laughs> so. what happens when I work the desk, right? <laughs> uh, so, yeah, we don't want to do that. Uh, so when we're reviewing the route planning, the first thing we're looking at is uh, all kinds of tools. We have the TAF, the METARs, we look at upper air prognostic charts, convective out forecast radar, uh, PIREP signals, ATC advisories, you name it. We have a, you know, if there's a toy, we have it and we can look at it to uh, make a good route. Uh, again, goal, most economical route, least time to burn, accounting for en route hazards and constraints. So for our purposes domestically, time and burn, uh, fuel burn and time. Internationally, it's a little different. You have to pay other countries to fly over the airspace. That can get really expensive. So sometimes we'll take a higher burn route to avoid that airspace. But uh, for our domestic purposes, you don't have to worry about that. Uh, the other issue we have is ATC thinks they know better than dispatch. 
and they uh, will routinely put out advisories that we then have to comply with. So this is the uh, JFK mid-routes ATC advisory. It's a required routing, and it states how we're going to fly the JFK. But if you look at this advisory, it says panhandle as the first fix. Now, panhandle's in Texas, way far away. We're not going to go direct panhandle. SoCal's not going to like that. So what that uh, means is we can plan whatever we want as long as we're at panhandle. And once we're at panhandle, we have to file the rest of the route that's there. And if we don't, ATC is going to say, try again and reroute us onto that. So it behooves us to do that anyways. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to review the in-route weather and plan the route. So we input the required route portion into PFPX. We're going to click Build. And it'll optimize from LAX to Panhandle. And then we'll uh, file the route from Panhandle the rest of the way. Come on. All right, so PFPX just did its magic, and we got a little upper air prog there, and that's a pretty good route. You see the hashed uh, cloud area red? That's some thunderstorms. The little, uh, it's hard to see, but the little yellow dash line, that's an area of moderate turbulence. Uh, we have to poke through that on the uh, required route, but it's not that big of a deal. It's just a little bit. So we avoid the thunderstorms. We complied with ATC, and we limit our exposure to turbulence, so that's a good route. Takeoff and landing performance, uh, this is a big, complicated topic. Uh, essentially, we just got to make sure we're at a weight where we can uh, take off and, and land within our limits. Um, we can cover that more offline. Uh, here's just some uh, things that can cause you performance issues, uh, takeoff weights, climb, obstacles, all that kind of stuff. Let's skip through this. Um, landing weight, similarly, we got to make sure we're at a weight where we can land. Um, we don't want to break the airplane. Going on to fuel load, uh, for fuel, the regulations define the bare minimum fuel we have to have. We have to be able to fly to where we're dispatched, so A to B. We have to fly to our most distant alternate. We listed an alternate. We'd like to get there, right? And then the FAA doesn't trust us, so they say, you guess what? You know what? You're going to put 45 minutes extra fuel on anyways as a final reserve. And then we're going to add some extra gas if we think there's issues, uh, weather, traffic delays, maybe one instrument approach and a missed approach, or anything else we think might delay your landing, right? This is uh, known as bar fuel, burn off, alternate reserve. And that's how much the crew needs to get to the hotel bar. That's how you can remember that. <laughs> now, we're going to add extra fuel. Are the minimum requirements enough? No, absolutely not. So we're going to add extra fuel to protect the operational integrity. We don't want to divert. That's based on uh, how much I think we need. Reasons I might do that, thunderstorms, ATC volume, you know, Kennedy's busy. Uh, weather impact, if I see some thunderstorms nearby, maybe it's not going to hit the field, but it might cause us a delay. Uh, if I know we're going to take a huge taxi out delay, maybe when we send that airplane back to LA at AFK. Any uh, MEL, CDL additions required by that MEL. And then again, any reason, I think. And then the captain can always override me and add more gas because he's a little uh, concerned. So. so we call that the bare fuel, burn off all Extra. That's going to be your minimum release fuel. So given the traffic at Kennedy, we're going to add 50 minutes of extra. I don't think we're going to divert, uh, but we could get a hold, so that's why we're going to have that. If you're flying on VATS, I'm going into event, plan extra gas. It's simple. Uh, PFPX, you can add 50 minutes there. Uh, there's our final product. We're going to do a final uh, review. Are we at 300 per that ML? We have our file 29, so we're good there. We're on the ATC required route. We looked at the weather. We decided you know, we had the alternates we needed. Destination alternate, we have that. Takeoff alternate, we have that. Fuel meets the far minimum, and we added a little bit of extra just to protect the flight. So uh, We released the flight. You can send it uh, via that send button, and you can uh, pre-file on VATS, and that's a really handy tip. And you can export to get PMDG data link work, and that works very well for that. All right. Uh, where are we at time? Uh, okay. Can we take like five more minutes? That's fine. We'll be through it quick. Thank you. Okay. So we did all that work for the release. Uh, that's 10% of the job. You know, we if you were at our session yesterday, you heard we had 30 flights or so that I actually released. Still, that 30 flights is 10% of my job. The 90% is the most important, and that is flight monitoring. 
We can create safe, legal, efficient releases all day, but aircraft are perfectly safe when they're on the ground, right? Where we earn our money is when things happen in the air and we have to respond and react and keep the airplane safe. So we are tasked with providing the crew with extra, with updates, anything changes in route, changes to the plan, we have to let them know, that's our responsibility. So we're always looking out ahead of that flight, right? Uh, things that could require dispatch action, any change really, right? All right, so we got a little holding scenario here. Uh, we got a hold going into the Kennedy. They said 30 minutes, we have 23.9 on board. Good thing we planned that extra, right? Can we accept the hold or will we need to divert now? I planned extra, I think we're gonna be okay, right? Well, I can figure it out. Bar fuel, right? So the burn off, if I look at my flight plan, how goes it? 1,400 pounds. I go to my <clears throat> alternate reserve that I pull from the release. You can see my bar fuel to continue on is 15.1. So I have 23.9, I need 15.1, I have 8.8 8 on board potentially. 43 minutes to hold, if I do the math, yeah, we're good to go. Here's the big deals. All right, so I get a, uh, I just released the Kennedy flight, right? Well, I got a 737 heading down to Key West and you know everything's going fine with them. You know, I'm not worried about it. All of a sudden, ACARS message, hey, we lost hydraulic system B. So, I go to the QRH, our emergency uh, procedures, find out we lost some of our flight spoilers, uh, we don't have our full range of flaps and slats, we're in alternate braking mode, we have some thrust aver um, reverser issues, we have a short runway and it's released, recently rained, and now we have significant maintenance needed on this aircraft. We got a problem. Do you think it's safe to continue? No. No, I agree. So. Captain has the ultimate authority over the aircraft. That doesn't leave me in my responsibility of saying, hey, going on is not a good idea because if that airplane has an incident, it's still me on the line. So I'm gonna tell the captain, hey, let's not go to Key West, let's divert to Miami. That's gonna be the safest course of action. So yeah, it's all about safety. That's, that's why we're here and this pilot dispatch system is a reason why we keep the airplane so safe. So, uh, so yeah, we are a little bit over. I'm sorry about that. Uh, we'll cut it off here. And if you have any questions for us, we're going to be uh, out in the lobby for you. That's great. And kind of just one one closing remark. Uh, I had a real nice conversation this morning with Gary. I think he's out there someplace. Uh, he's one of our, uh, our Chicago-based uh, American pilots. Uh, if you really want to kind of hear about what we do from the perspective of a pilot, uh, I'm sure he'd be uh, around uh, this weekend to uh, kind of tell you about that. Uh, but, you know, we're just, uh, as Gary would tell you, we're kind of here on the ground. We're, we're there for them, right? So everything we do on the ground is to support the, uh, the, the flight crew uh, in, in the air, right? So and that, uh, that example that Matt just talked about was uh, kind of a perfect example of that. So any kind of non-normal, uh, we're there to support the, uh, the crew as best we can. So. All right, so I think that's, uh, that's probably going to be our time this morning. But uh, thank you. Thank you for coming. And uh, as, as Matt mentioned, if any questions, uh, we'll, we'll be around all weekend. Thanks again. Uh, oh, by the way, there's a, a few uh, freebies, giveaways up here, courtesy of uh, American Airlines Cargo and some uh, flight dispatch brochures from a uh, school around Dallas-Fort Worth here. So.